Toss aside the touchy-feely notions of love in business and recognize the real power it holds. Welcome to the Love is Just Damn Good Business podcast with host Steve Farber, drawing on his work with a wide variety of companies from the Fortune 100 to smaller family-owned businesses. Farber shares inspiring interviews with business leaders and proven strategies for how you can create experiences that your customers will love by developing a culture that your employees, teammates, and colleagues love working in. Discover why and how love at the end of the day is just damn good business for you too. Here's your host, Steve Farber. Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Love is Just Damn Good Business podcast. I'm your host, Steve Farber. You can watch this podcast on video, listen to the whole thing, or read an entire transcript or all of the above if you really want to absorb it, at stevefarber.com slash podcast. And of course, you can go there to subscribe and to check out all the other episodes as well. Today, it's my great pleasure uh, to welcome Matt Barnett, who is the founder of a company called Bonjuro, a technology company, which we're going to hear about in just a bit. And uh, Matt is uh, is a bit of a serial entrepreneur. He's uh, an industrial designer and artist, originally from from the UK. He's now living in Australia. And he's had a couple of false starts along the way, as any entrepreneur had, has had, myself included. And he has a love for building great products, but more so he has a love for building great cultures. And that is why I've asked him to join us here today. Uh, at Bonjuro, they have their culture, they call it um, customers as friends. And it's been the main driver of their business success. And they're just getting started, really, because their goal, their stated goal, is to be the next Zappos. In other words, they aspire to be the most beloved brand in the world. So that rings my bells. Uh, so Matt, it is great to have you here on the podcast. Thanks for joining me all the way from down under. Down under in Australia. Th thanks, Steve, for having me. Yeah, my, my pleasure. So so let's start out with uh, with the uh, the Matt Barnett story. Uh, you and I have met, uh, well, it was a long time ago. I think according to my records, we met maybe uh, 120 seconds ago. So that was a long time in, in this day and age. So so you and I are just starting to get to know each other. So let's let's do this together. Tell tell me and us your story. Uh, so from the UK, I, I am British. Uh, went was trained in design. Um, got fed up of surfing in Scotland in the snow, and uh, I decided to move to warmer climes. So I moved to Australia uh, many years ago. Um, was always intending on starting a business, came here, fell into tech. Um, I actually fell into it because I'm on a date uh, with my first ever founder and we did not hit it off. Uh, but we decided to start a company instead, which was interesting. Um, did the whole raise my off we go, uh, had all the fun, and then crashed and burned in flames, <laughs> which, is, which, is, which is exciting. So, uh, but it, you know, wait, hold on. Let me just make sure I'm, I'm <laughs> So you were dating somebody that didn't work out. So you started the business together. No, that no, we, we actually went, we went on one date and there was no, there was no spark. Uh, but I remember like six hours later, we come up with a business plan. <laughs> we, we, we were going ahead. So we didn't hit it off, but we obviously, we, we, we were exactly the same. We were very, we were very similar. Which is probably one of the issues. We were also both creatives, which I think was a, was probably a, a bad idea for a founding couple. But we just kind of went off and were like, "Let's do this." So it was it was it was probably one of the best dates because of where it came out to. Um, yeah. Yeah. So you started you started a, a company out of that. We started a company like the next day. We just the next day, and that didn't work out so well. No, I think it, it just uh, we were we were pretty naive. It, it was a B two C company. It was around. It was actually playing a video, but it was around family life stories. Um, I think we, we, we went out with a great idea. It was a good concept. I met, I remember going to the States and meeting someone who tried it before. He was like, man, it's hard. It won't work. Here's the challenges that you're going to hit. And I was like, whatever, we'll, we'll do it anyway. And you know, I should listen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
how many <laughs> how many stories do we all uh -huh. have? I got to listen. In, in in retrospect, it's all so obvious. Um, but so that was uh, chronologically. Let's uh, just like I like to keep track of this sort of thing. Ten years, ten years ago. Ten years ago. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so obviously you didn't say well that's it for being an entrepreneur you said that idea didn't work so what what happened next well i was pretty interested about buy video i think it's like the first so this is yeah, a couple of years later the first phones are playing around with like video something this opens up and we're looking at something like there's something exciting here and we ended up building a company that did research by video so what we would do is we would have you know your your huggies your your craft want to do customer research around the world and so they might want to chat to mums in 12 countries about how they use huggies today in, in, in the world you know they might reach out to korea and brazil and, and japan and uk and germany and this is done by 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 brand and new product development teams obviously because i was i was from an industrial design background i kind of understood the industry and so we we're like we should just do this using mobile videos and so we would get people to run diaries for a week where they would you know, film them changing their kids and they would film how they stored the stuff and they would talk through and they would take they would take the camera shopping with them as well. And we did a lot of it in new in new age countries, um, obviously where product development was massive. And then this would all come in overnight. We'd all be pulled out, we'd pull all the insights out of it, we work with you know researchers and we pull together reports uh, and videos on this. Um, and it was you know there's an awesome trifecta where it was you know, very cost effective, very quick and and then high quality research. Um, obviously all by type and that kind of kicked off and then off we, and off we started going and I started building this with another, another founder here. Um, the challenge we had is that, again, living in Australia, great place to live and surf, um, small country and there's not a lot of headquarters here. So because we dealt with large FMCG and large brands, they were all based in London, Paris, and New York. Right. Which so you don't is sleep the opposite. Ever. <laughs> What's that? So you don't sleep ever. You don't sleep. Well, so you don't see the first six months and then, and then it hits you, you know, it's like, like, like business is about being sustainable. So like, I love like the initial energy you get to, you need to get to a place where you've got a, a sustain, something sustainable that you keep going for 10 years. Um, you know, and we hit this point where I mean, I'm just going to cut me off if you want to go any deeper, but, um, we kind of started to get inquiries and leads coming from countries, which were down under to us. Okay, uh, well, before, before before you take us to the next phase there, so the 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 technology you were working with was using video on mobile phones to get to capture the experience of of consumers, right? Like you said, for example, Huggies. Exactly. And you were using that video as was it for simply for research for brand research for your clients? Simply qualitative research. Yeah. Okay. Qualitative, really? so it wasn't. It wasn't a. It wasn't like a social media marketing kind of a thing. It was just to to capture to get really close to the experience of the customer of the user, and then use that experience as information for your clients. Yeah, and this is. I mean, I'll harken about this. Yeah, like when we talk about video, I don't think there were there like there were video companies, there are communication companies, and there's research companies, and video. To us, is a medium. I think it's an amazing way to get a window. It's an amazing way for us to talk today. Doing this, it's an amazing way to connect with customers. It's an, it's an amazing way to get a, get a window into people's lives. And you have this other thing where mobile devices are probably the most personal things we own. I think it used to be used to be vehicles or homes. Now, now it's a mobile device. You know, you, you sleep with it. You take it, you take it to the toilet with you. You know, it, it goes everywhere with you. Um, and so when people, you saw this interesting thing that when people started to use video on mobile they would open up like never before and because they become comfortable with this device and so the way they would interact with this versus a computer was completely different you know, we actually tried doing like web web recording didn't work the mobile device they would walk around with it they would go into things and so you get this you get the user's point of view of their life it it would absolutely be you know you have to understand there were biases in there because they're using a device you know it's not like there's a remote camera watching them right um, but you get these moments when they're on, like, and, and so and you're watching this and you're doing the research, and it opens your eyes massively into like, what's out there in the world. And it's very like you'd have like, like extremely emotional content coming in. You know, we did a lot. Like we did, we've done research for every single major brand you can think of. You know, from alcohol to we've even done stuff for drugs. Uh, we've done stuff for kids. 
Um, and you see yeah, hugely emotional content, very personal content, which is also amazing to, be able to put that in the hands of people making serious decisions who are sitting in headquarters back in London, you know, because you can then suddenly connect them and they're like, you know, wow, this is not this is not what we expected. And because we do a lot of the stuff in like new in new world countries, you would get like it's not it's it, there is no there is no comfort, you know, that you have these amazing things. Although they would still have mobile devices, which is which always kind of blew your mind. Yeah. Well, you know, you know, what's interesting to me about that, Matt, is, is, um, you know, early on in, in my career, I'm going to, I'm going to say back in the like mid nineties, uh, this whole idea of, of getting close to the customer and, and the concept of customer intimacy, uh, was first, it was really first starting to be talked about back then. And the challenge as consultants that we would always give to our clients is, is you, you have to get out of your, your kind of self-contained ivory tower sort of world and get up close with your customer, really experience what their experience is in using your product or service, right? But then the technology of, of adding video to that as a, as a way to capture that experience is, I imagine, was, was really powerful. It's like, and it's, it, it's another arrow in, in the quiver. So it, it was something that hadn't been done before. <clears throat> Suddenly you were stepping it, 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 we, we talked about it as like a window into their lives, which really is, it, is what it was. Yeah, it wasn't exhaustive. It wasn't like, you know, photo shoot's still good. I still think like, you know, at home interviews are good as well with good interviewers. Um, so you haven't got that two way process, but it's, it's a very different type of content that would come in. I think it fundamentally starts to change how researchers would do research too. So they would pull this in as you know, to augment other things they were doing. Um, but it was just, again, you look back now and you couldn't help be influenced by, by the content you saw coming in and the connection you have. And again, living a life of customers coming from design myself, it, it was mind blowing what you could do. And you could do it very, very quickly as well. Mm. Um, so it was, it was eye opening for us. It also kind of started to show the power of video as well it wasn't you know we had to kind of drag it kicking and screaming because the video like you know, the first iphone just had video so we couldn't do anything on android and then and android's got video but then no one had connection you know you're on like 2g you know, especially in these countries and then you had to like you know, people had to like go out to like internet cafes to upload it and it was but it, but it was exciting to be in it at that point where it was starting to change it and you were looking at it and you were going well something's changing like something something's happening here this is a different world that we're stepping into where suddenly you've got a camera in every pocket yeah so um to to just jump ahead a little bit bonjuro uh, i want to go right to present time because for for people who are listening uh, who are not familiar with what you guys do i think this would be a great time to tell us about that because i can see the connection with what you just described in an earlier iteration so what is what is bonjuro about and what do you guys do and what do you offer yeah, so it's a one-to-one -one personalized video messaging system uh, that allows you to connect with customers at certain points on the customer journey, primarily to drive more lead conversions, drive more activations in products, or to drive more referrals. Um, so, so, so basically, it's a way for me, for example, to instead of, um, or maybe in addition to sending an email to somebody saying thank you for signing up for xyz i could shoot a quick video is that and and they can so it becomes more personal face-to-face -face. is that the concept yes, and it's 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 asynchronous what i mean by that is it is, is one way so what's happening is that a customer will take a very simple scenario um you're going to just welcome you, you customers that come into your funnel so you or, or new leads so, so someone signs up you're using so we, it plays as a layer on, on other systems. So if you're using a Salesforce or HubSpot or Shopify, like you name it, they come in, we notify you. We say, look, Brian from Oklahoma has signed up. Um, he works for ConvertKit. He's had a marketing. And we give you, we give you information about the customer as well. Uh, we also show you what he's done. We're like, by the way, he came in through a webinar and he's, you know, downloaded this, this lead gen thing, XYZ. 
that image displays when you've got two minutes, you stop your work, you pull out your phone or your desktop and you record a video, but you're recording it for, for Brian from Oklahoma. So this is not an automated generic piece of content. It's not, right. it's not even content, it's communication. And so what you're doing is you're stepping out of your day for you know, no more than one minute to show Brian that he matters to you as a company, that you're thankful that he's come in. And at the back of this, you are, you are by the way, driving Brian to take a next very important action, which depending what he's done, because everyone has different customer journeys, could be to you know, book a call or download another piece of content or fill out the form that he's forgotten to fill out, whatever that is. Um, but the fact that you're taking the time to connect with him, you know, he is much more willing to go and take this next steps because he's like, wow, these, these, these guys care. Which, it, which in the online experience in the world of automation, uh, is actually incredibly rare. So uh, to, to paint a, a picture we're using Bonjuro with Bonjuro. So let's say I went and I signed up for Bonjuro. Uh, as as uh, sign up for the service for for me to use my own customer outreach, would I get a lot you know a, a video message from one of your team? You absolutely would. I can't say who from. Uh, so we share it across the team. So I do some every single day, um, regardless. So if you sign up at about this time, like at six a.m. in the morning Australian time, whatever like afternoon EST. Um, you'll get a you, you might get one from me. Uh, you might get one from the Australian team, but later we also have the US team and the UK team tends to do them as well. Um, we all chip in to get them. Um, I think. So I worked on the other day. I, I've spent seven and a half days of my life <laughs> sending videos to people, like like back to back. And that's how many whatever it is, how many hours that is, a couple hundred hours. Um, I think there's a there's a point here, and maybe it's coming from the background and, and having the research background as well. I think as a founder, and I, I, look, and I am very product driven, I, like I am a product guy still, I still support product management. I, I think you have to keep that thread to the end customer. I think you should keep it no matter how big you get. Um, I think a company does this really well is, you know, like Zapier, I think is, is, is an awesome example, or, or, or sorry, Zapier. Um, Cause I know they always had a piece where they're, they're, the whole team gets hands on to support. Uh, but they used to do it once a week for an hour or so. And that, like, now they probably do it like one week a month. Um, but you know, you can be able to support and you can get Wade Foster, who's, who's the CEO, like coming on and helping out. I think, I mean, this starts to segue into the culture side, but I think also in terms of building a good business, if, you, if, if, if those of you that run the ship at the top of the pyramid are connected to you know, the, the end goal, which is the customer in a very intimate way, and you, and you talk to them and, you know, and they bring your problems you know, and you say, look, if you ever need anything, you've got my email, hit me up. And they're like, but you're the CEO. You're like, it doesn't matter. I just, yeah, if, you, if you help Jane, like, like you've got me, you hit me up. Um, it, it, it's a wonderful trigger line for things that are going well, things that aren't going well. Um, it helps you empathize, helps you empathize with your CS team, with your product team, helps you build better products. Um, and so I think, I guess my point is whatever you do, do not lose sight of the customer. And unfortunately, I think, I think some leadership teams do, and the excuse is they don't have time, which I don't think is a good excuse. Yeah, yeah. The um, it sounds like what what your technology allows for is a a quick, easy, personal connection between a face at the company, a real person at the company, and and the customer. Um, so if uh, if somebody signed up, let's say for um, one of my audio programs and I got a notification for it and I just shot a quick video that said, Hey Matt, I saw that you just signed up for the extreme leadership audio. Just want to say welcome aboard. If you got any questions, shoot me an email, Steve at stevefarber.com. But thanks for being here. That's it. Right. That's it. And, and what happens then there's, there's a, there is a, a relationship that starts to get created. I mean, a real relationship, not an not an automated canned relationship, but a real one. Uh, that's and it, it goes back to um, the the previous company that you worked with about you know filming people's experience and it, it's just about bringing people closer together, bringing the customer closer to the company, right? And 
so for me, when I hear that, it's it, my my position has always been that our competitive advantage as business people is to create an experience for our customers that they're going to love. Anything short of their loving what we do for them and how we do it, we're not competitive. It doesn't it doesn't build brand loyalty and and you know customer referrals and, and that sort of a thing. So this is a really simple technology, it sounds to me, to begin to build that relationship in a way that's really gonna be surprising for a lot of people. I, I think I think the good thing about so video as a medium is that you can get 80% of the results with zero experience. So I think just it's one of those things where just turning up is is actually good enough. You know, like like a lot of people like a lot of things always love I mean it's just not good enough. This is one of the situations where turning up is good enough because when you're in the online space and we're disconnected, you know, like like I'm in, I'm in Australia, like most of my customers, 95% are overseas. So like when we turn up, they're like, oh, that you know, you're here. Like that's already gone above what others would do. Then what what you say and how you behave, like Again, if you're a likable person, if, you know, if your team have cult, and this comes down to the culture, you know, like, like empower your team to, to talk in the right way and do the right things. People will like them. Like people generally like people. You know, ninety-nine percent of the time. So whatever they say, as long as they mention a name and show that it is personal, you, you you've got them. Yeah. And over time, you can get better. Again, like as as business, obviously, the end result of this of this love and, and this best first impression, you know, again, this connection, is to drive more conversations that drive more more business so there are reasons you're doing this um but don't worry about those because again as long as you're making the connection the rest just follows on like a- as it would do if you could meet you know 100 people a day for coffee like, that that would be wonderful it's just it's just unfortunately not not scalable and possible right right yeah so that's a really great point because i think a lot of people get intimidated by video i know i listen i i i i'm a victim of this mentality myself so i do you know quite a bit of video really? <laughs> and there's and there is this whole thing about you know i gotta get the lighting right and what am i gonna say i gotta be is my hair any of my hair is all my hair in place you know and uh and then you shoot the video what you're saying is just show up just just it, it, that that doesn't matter. What matters is the connection, uh, because people don't expect they don't expect you know broadcast network <laughs> level uh, production I, quality in this stuff. I would argue that so so, so it's about authenticity as well here, yeah? especially yeah. especially in the world today of you know fake news etc. I think authenticity has become more important, and so turning up with your hair ruffled, you know, not not perfect. I, I would argue probably has a better impact because your customers aren't perfect <laughs> like yeah and you're like oh this is this, this guy's real yeah like like, like, like imperfection is, is is beautiful if you ask me uh maybe that's the artist things like me at but um when it's imperfect you know you know it's real so almost the more real this is that's the point you know it's not it's you know it, 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 it's it's a human it's not someone wearing a shirt and tie anymore yeah and i'm portraying the brand the brand is the people and that's what you want to connect with Beautiful. All right, so let's let's take that and and expand on it in terms of Bonjuro. So now we got a sense of what Bonjuro offers as a as a service, you know, very high level. Um, so tell us a little bit about about the company, and and I want to start with some of the vital statistics. So you said you have you have folks all over the globe, basically. So how long have you guys been in business, and about how many folks do you have on your team? So we're three and a half years in business. We're fourteen people. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are. So we're two cities in Australia. We're Philippines, London, um, West Coast of the States, South Africa, and Poland. And are you guys set up primarily as a as a B to C or or B to B sort of a, a surely yeah. surely B to B? Yeah, and most of our clients, most of our customers are B to B as well. Interestingly, gotcha. Interesting. So. You built, you started building this, this thing a few years ago. Did you give any thought from the outset? Did you give any thought to the kind of culture that you would like to create? Or was it, or was it all about the technology? So I, 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 I take kind of brand and culture synonymously. Like, like to me, they kind of build at the same time. And I think uh, we did take conscious effort pretty early on to start to think about what, what it is we want to build. 
Um, but I'd say again, th- 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 this this combined with brand and it combined with product positioning and, and, and the product design, like it all kind of converged into one verse. Um, so I think it came a part of that. We have a very lighthearted nature. You know, the the team we have are very close. You know, we uh, we take a lot of time with the team. You know, we have get together. We fly the whole team to one country once a year. We were flying the whole team to a country, to a country once a year as well, um, where we don't do any work. We just hang out. Um, yeah, the teams in, in different countries will go out camping and go out fishing together, et cetera. Um, so we have this, this extremely close culture, which, which has its upsides and, and its downsides, I'll be honest. Um, so we knew that was part of it and wanted to, to extend that to customers. I think. So what, in- what is, what's the upside? So the upside is uh, communication. Like, absolutely. So trust. So when you know people and you're friends with them, you can have the harder conversations. Like, forget the good conversations, because that's all easier. Like, the hard conversations are the things that, that, that matter. Those are the turning points. Yeah. So, if people have an issue with each other, which, which happens, like, like you know, <laughs> someone's having a bad day in the UK, and then 12 hours later, you get on Slack, and there's no one else to rant at. Um, you're going to have breakdowns in communication, you have differences, but you raise them, and you bring them up, and you sort them. And what's the downside? The downside is... Everyone's extremely close as well. So maybe, you know, you can have emotional issues probably probably would happen more. Uh, people can get hurt more, I think, if things if things aren't handled well. Um, because again, your friends, you're not just colleagues where you can shrug stuff off. So that's again, it's 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 uh I know the I know the I know the, I know the, I know the CEOs here who do not run their business that way and they will be afraid to do it. And I think for their culture that's fine. Um, it's it's a choice. I'm not saying everyone should do it that way. Right. Um, but I think, I guess one of the key things here is that we, we, our customer culture and our team culture, I would say are extremely similar, if not the same. Um, and I think part of that is like, I, I think it's probably the same for a lot of businesses. I think we've, we've made a very conscious decision around that because it's just easier for us. So we work with people that we like, and that does not make a difference if they're a customer or a team member or a partner or an investor, anything else. We just build the same people all around us, people that we like. You know, we have fired multiple customers that we do not think are a right fit for the company. Um, I, t- I tell my whole team, doesn't matter who they are, juniors, seniors, I'm like, if, if someone's not behaving well, just send them off to someone else. Like, there's other solutions, send them off there, say, say thank you. We don't need their business. Um, you know, that reminds me of a, of a, a story. It's kind of. Uh... It might be apocryphal at this point, but uh, but Herb Herb Kelleher, the founder of Southwest Airlines, which is which is a you know a U.S. airline that's that's often cited as being a great example of customer service and all that. Um, he was said to have received a letter from a dissatisfied customer. This is a long time ago, and the customer was you know he was complaining about all the things that were quintessentially Southwest. You know your flight attendants shouldn't be making jokes when they're doing when they're doing the you know the safety announcements and and i don't like that you heard us around like cat you know just that all just complaining about southwest yeah. and his response uh to this customer was uh three words we'll miss you <laughs> that was it <laughs> we're the we're the wrong we're the wrong airline for you. So that sounds like it's kind of what you're saying. I mean, there are there are always other customers. I'm just curious um, because this is this is a it's a it's a great business principle in in my opinion that there are times where you need to uh, there are times where you need to fire employees and there are times you need to fire customers. Now. Firing a customer is is a bit of a foreign concept for a lot of people, particularly those in you know early on. You know, three you guys are three and a half years into this thing, right? It takes a lot of balls to fire a customer, doesn't it? So I'm just curious, without naming names, is there an example of a customer that you it just became really clear was the wrong kind for you, so therefore you said goodbye? I can't. So like, there's, there's, a bit, there's been quite a few <laughs> where. People come in, so we've had we've had the whole. We think your brand is too playful and needs to be be more serious. Uh, I'm like, that's great. Go you know, hang out with a serious company. Uh, we've had people be be rude on support, um, and often I tell my here's the thing, I tell my team, you can fly customers if you want to. You know, you can let me know. They're not all as 
tough nosed than some of us. Like I have stepped into customers before where I've seen it pop up or someone else has flagged it. And I've stepped in and said, yeah, thanks for business. I've refunded your last six months. You know, no hard feelings. Here's a go and use the system. Um, and then often people will come, <laughs> funny is people will then come back to that and they'll apologize and they'll ask to stay. And their answer is always no. Um, because if someone's behaving badly once, I don't, I don't care if you like, I, I understand people have bad days and I understand that, you know, and every now and again, you, like, 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 like you have to take them into consideration. Yes. Yeah? So you, you don't just do this willy nilly because you need to have some empathy with customers. But if someone's done something multiple times, you know, they're a serial offender and you know, that's just who they are. And I think here's the thing. If you think it's scary to fire a customer, think about, so you're probably familiar with how it works with team members. Like we've all had team members that haven't worked out and you need to get rid of them because if you have the wrong person in your culture, it can be, it, it, it's destructive. And if you don't nip it in the butt, it will, it will compound and it can, it can destroy culture. It can send other team members away. It, it can impact the business like so seriously. I think having bad customers on a lesser extent can have the same impact because if your frontline team are dealing with these people and your frontline team are not always that tough, um, you know, then it will ruin their day. A simple conversation, a few bad words, somebody not being understanding can ruin someone's day and upset them. And that person will then not perform, they'll not feel good. And I, I, don't, I don't want that in my company. Um, no, no single customer, I, no customer at all is, is worth that. And the ones that do it, because we've obviously had this in the past, especially when we used to do, you know, the private business where we have, we have very, very big clients. The ones that have done it before, they will do it again and they will do it again. I just, I don't think there's any excuse for bad behavior. Yeah. So if they're, um, if, if their complaint about your company particularly relates to who you are, as a company that's clearly the wrong customer for you it's like it's like you know you said you guys are too lighthearted. <laughs> okay then we're but brand, this is brand new. like 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 be be confident on your brand this is the thing like do not be wishy-washy on your brand but like personally like if you're starting a company day one like get into like understand what your brand is do not lie to yourself don't be like oh we want to go change the world. if you don't want to change the world don't say you want to change the world it's fine yeah if your culture is like cutthroat that's absolutely fine. If that works for you, you need to know it and you need to hire people who are cut for it. Like, that's okay. Your brand is your culture. It's your tribe. You can, you can behave within bounds how you want to behave. Don't go outside of that, yeah? And what will happen is that if you have a stronger brand, like Southwest Airlines, if you have a brand that sticks to that, you will attract customers that fit that brand. But most importantly, you will generate like advocates and super fans. Um, people will come in who love that brand. Wishy washy brands don't have do not have people who tattoo that, you know, like, like, yeah, you don't like Iron Man, like love or hate it. People tattoo on, on, on their arms. People don't tattoo wishy-washy brands on their arms. And yeah, you want to be a company where people are going to tattoo you, but not, not literally. You want to be a company where people w would love you enough to tattoo you on, on, on their arms for life. Sometimes it is literally there. There's a, there's a company. Um, I think they're primarily in the U S if not exclusively called anytime fitness. Yeah, they're here as well. Uh, they, they, so they they have customers that have literally tattooed their their icon the company icon on their bodies that that's just a success story if you ask me that, yeah, that, that is a story sure and, and, and the best brands and the best it, like even the best tribes because that's what we are building here have lovers and they have haters like you can't fit to everyone the idea of like niche and you have lots of large niches and, and small niches is a great thing again because you will get customers when you find them will never leave you. Whereas if you're on the fence, ah, we'll use you for a bit, we'll use a competitor, like, well, here we go. Um, so I just think, I, like, I, I think be, be bold with culture, be bold with brand, mix them together and own that space. And if someone doesn't fit, it, it's fine. Like, it doesn't matter. Yet. Like, you know, like, they're not going to work out for you anyway. Make sure you get the ones that fit and stick. So I'm I'm inferring from this some of the characteristics of Bonjuro's culture. But what in in your words, what are they? What are the characteristics that really define who you guys are as a culture and a brand? Yeah, so abs absolute transparency is kind of the first piece. So we're, with customers, with ourselves, um, we so definitely have that that kind of weird, wacky nature as well. I'd say uh, a lot of us are what's the word? Um, uh, Gets in mind, um, just slightly mad. 
I think. Eccentric? Um, eccentric, that's the word. So eccentric. Um, we love customers who are eccentric as well. Like they are they're the ones we end up hanging out with. with, with I, went to, I went to a conference a while ago with a company called Design Pickle. And we all turned up wearing bear suits and they all turned up wearing pickle suits. And so we all stormed the stage and just like, and just, we just owned the whole conference. And it was like, it was just awesome. Like, <laughs> so good. Like, that's the kind of thing that's amazing. Um, we are, we do have a very hard, hard working ethic and we are quite blunt, I would say as well. So we don't tend to mess around with, with insights or with data or with decisions. We like, we prefer everyone. This is going to come back to transparency. If you don't agree, say it. Yeah. If you don't agree, bring it up, fight for it as well. Um, and don't back down. So if you're shy, if, if you're quite spoken, um, as a team member, this is very much, this is, this is primarily internal. Um, you might not fit because your ideas might not get through because we are quite all, all strong, strong willed. Uh, but customers are the same. Yeah. If the ones who speak up and they're like, this isn't working. We're like, okay, cool. Let, let's hop on the call. Tell us why it's not working. Let's see how we can fix this. Um, we are pretty, we're not, this is, this is, this is, this one is a little bit aspirational. I'd say that we are, um, uh, I'd say non-profit kind of conscious um, and giving back. I would say this is not exclusive. There's definitely members of the team who are more driven in this aspect than others. It's not something that we wouldn't hire somebody for. I think as long as they have a, a, a empathy and they're compassionate, yes, we will bring people on board. Um, we try and, you know, we've done the whole 1% pledge for quite a while now. We, we, we were trying to encourage teams to do this more. We tend to get team members to pick this up more. Uh, but as a result, we also work with a lot, lot of charities, a lot of nonprofits. We spend, you know, uh, if they want to talk to us for hours and then to work out how to do it and they're paying $15 a month, that's fine. We'll, we'll spend all the time we can with them. Um, and just something as a company, I think we should do more of. I, we're doing a good job. I don't think it's good enough. Mm. Um, so, so, yeah, it, it, eccentricity, but at the same point, very blunt, very data driven, like work, hard working, um, and very open and transparent. And and uh, you said earlier, I can't remember exact the exact phrase, lighthearted, sense of humor, something. Oh yeah, so, a sense of humor is like in all in all in all. And this comes this is where it comes down to Indie Brand. Yeah, so our comms is pretty lighthearted. It, it, it's got a sense of humor. You know, everyone who starts working with the team, we we buy them bear suits when they work. But everyone who starts a job designs their own bear suit. We have these old grannies in the north of England that knit them for us. Um, <laughs> we send bear suits to customers and kids when they hit certain milestones. Uh, and then we, we have a lot of, we have so many pictures of like customers where they, we've sent them the bear bear suits and the kids have gone out for Halloween in the bear suits rather than wearing their costumes. So uh, what is it about, the, is the bear an icon for you guys? I mean, what's the, uh, I mean, yeah, it, it kind of just got out of hand. It, um, I don't even know why we started with a bear. I think we just wanted something friendly. I think we, like, we wanted to build a brand that, that had an icon that had a personality. And so we built this around a, like a MailChimp around, around an icon. Um, then we started doing the bear suit thing for a bit of fun internally. And then we like, and I was like, why don't we just send bear suits to kids, um, to, to customers' kids? And I mean, this is, this is cool. Yeah. Like you literally have customers wearing our brand. It's, it's like that's, they literally put our brand on. And I'm like, that, that, that's powerful. Yeah. And people love it and they think it's hilarious. And then, you know, we started doing all that. Yeah. You know, like, like we ended up like um, hiring a chief delight officer. Who now runs that community and is in charge of doing these things? And what I want to say with the whole delight and with the whole, you know, involving customers in this is that if for us it's a process, for the customer it's unexpected. So right. I think when you start to weed this in, we have certain trigger points and certain reasons for doing it, but we want the customer to believe it's you know unexpected, unique. You know, I, I, we do put time into this, um, but I think. Something like that, it, it started to, to, to roll. Oh, yeah, we've like sponsored koalas for customers as well. We sponsored a few bears in the Ukraine. It, it, it's kind of nice just to go, oh, whatever, we'll just do everything to do with bears because it's funny and it makes us laugh and it makes customers laugh. And some, again, some people come in and they're like, this is not serious enough. And I, and I like this. And you're like, we don't like you either. Go I prefer elephants to bears. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, I just got to say the 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 image of of a little a little British granny uh, sewing up a bear suit really makes me want one. <laughs> you can get you one if you like. <laughs> that that I'm I'm serious. I would love I would love a bear suit. And All I right, will get you one. Um, so, so that's, that's a really great, um, principle that you just said about 
to the to the customer the experience is is surprising and feels feels spontaneous and part of it is because it is personal but yet it's systematized for you guys it's in it's in the way that you do business so it comes across as as surprising and spontaneous to me the consumer but to you guys it's just the way that you do business so you've you've operationalized that that fun and surprise into into the way you you guys do things but, yeah look i think if you think about what what makes the light like so we, we call it research that's quite a lot is because part of what we do in the videos is the light piece, which we understand. So, like, it's got to be unexpected. Okay, so that's the number one thing. Now, to that, it's, it's simple. Yeah, like, like, you, like, I, I, I have, we have triggers for things like the bear suits, which is when they hit certain volumes of sending. Now, that could happen on day four, if they're a machine, or it could happen on you know, on year two. So, it's not wedded to like a specific time. Um, you know, the other thing is is that it, is that to keep it delightful, you, you need to change it up. So. You know, even say this is one thing with 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 with, with video. Videos again, it, it's a quiver in your tool. It's not the answer for everything. Don't send the video message at every single point in the customer funnel. Like it's not that's not the point. Yeah, do it once at the beginning. Like make your best first impression, and then maybe you know do it down you know, down the line when you're looking to engage someone for you know, the advocacy of the funnel side. Um, but in the meantime, use all your other methods of of, of communication. Mix it up because again, like the, the way our brain works, you know. Experiencing different things, you know, at different speeds and, uh, and different types is, is exciting. You know, it's like acceleration and deceleration. If you're going 100 k's an hour, or 100 miles an hour, that's not exciting. If you're going 50 to 70 k's an hour, as you're accelerating, that's when you feel the thrill. So, right. so think about delight as this. And then, you know, when you have triggers for these pieces, I wouldn't wed them to bait like one week, two weeks, 30 days. Try to think about metrics or trigger points that would be different for different customers you know, a volume ascending maybe they've read x number of courses maybe maybe, maybe they've hit episode seven um whenever that happens and then put in points and it, i mean his challenge is is like don't try to make it gimmicky but and it doesn't have to be you don't have to be fun like us it's not about that so it's not about that yeah it might be buying lunch for somebody it might be coffee it might be giving them a free month off it might be donating to charity um, it might be, you know, an extra training session or or, or something. Um, do the thing that matches with your brand. I'm not. It's not about gimmicks. It's just about do the unexpected and put a bit of personal time in, like always, like thirty seconds to an hour. Put it in, depending on the value of the client, and they will recognize and appreciate that. Fantastic. So <clears throat> this is uh, what a great story. So I'm um, I'm assuming that uh, that Bonjour is doing well. Are you guys? How are you holding up in uh, in in this uh, these uh, let's call them interesting and unusual times? I think so. So obviously, like where we are, it's a very interesting space. I think there's a few things changing. I think people are so. I think people are now it's starting to struggle and get through connecting with not just team but now but now the customers, especially in, in, in kind of remote working space. I think there's other changes, which is uh, the way that we're starting to blend working from home versus working at work and that dropping down of these barriers I mentioned earlier. So I think it's now okay for uh, customers to do calls in t-shirts and shorts rather than the suit and tie. Like I see corporates now doing this as well, which, which I think is wonderful because it's it, it, it's more true to the individual. It doesn't mean they have to lose their brand. I think a world of fake news and authenticity is starting to happen as well. We want, we want to see the real. We want to be able to trust. So I think there's been a lot of erosion of trust and how, how do we get that back? This is part of that as well. Um, so I think there's a few things that are, pl that are playing into this. I, I think the idea of personalization at scale as well is a result of this. So how do you how do you personalize the customer journey at true scale? And I think you know scientifically, if you think about this, there's a what's the ROI on your time? Like when when does it behoove one to you know invest a minute in a customer or an hour or, or this um, in order to help grow your business? Like the, the, the way we talk about this. Um, yeah, again, this is a change. Is yeah, you know, we always say automate processes, not relationships. And what we mean by that is take the stuff out of the business where it doesn't need you personally. Operationalize whatever you can, because the whole point is to free up your time, because your time is the most important thing, and then invest that time, depending where you're on the company, back into customers. Right. That will get you a return. Like that's the best return your time you could do. 
Right. Fantastic. So as we as we bring this in for a landing, and thank you for sharing that story, Matt. It's fantastic. Um, I'd like to uh, uh, quote for for reasons that will become obvious. I'd like to quote the great philosopher uh, Tina Turner, <laughs> who once said, who once asked the the age old question, "What's love got to do with it?" So from your perspective as, as a serial entrepreneur and the founder of Bonjuro or co-founder of Bonjuro and, and a technologist and all that, what, that's my question for you. What's love got to do with all this? So if you love what you do, and this is everything, yeah? So I, in the business, love, love your team, love, love the products and services you're, you're building and love the customers that you work with, surround yourself with good people, you, that happiness will come through and you will build better products. You will make better hires. You will inspire your team to work harder. You will work harder yourself. You'll get out of bed every day excited. And you and your team and your customers will all perform and your business will grow faster. It's, it's not rocket science. It's not rocket science. Great. Fantastic. Matt Barnett, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you for listening in to this episode of the Love is Just Damn Good Business podcast. Until next time, do what you love in the service of people who love what you do. Thank you for listening to another episode of Love is Just Damn Good Business with Steve Farber. Join us again next time because when customer and employee satisfaction just isn't enough anymore, we are here to back you up with specific ideas to operationalize love to make an enormous difference in your business, personal life, and the world around you. Visit our website at stevefarber.com to leave a review. And don't forget to share the love with your colleagues and friends because after all, it's just damn good business.